So it looks like we already have some attendees in the audience. Uh, my name is Megan Collins. I'm the research coordinator for Cure Grin, and I am joined today by some wonderful researchers uh, who are going to talk to us about lots of different medications and how things work um, and some potential treatments to consider for GRIN patients. Uh, so first off, we're going to have a presentation by Catherine Ensign, who is a PhD candidate at the University of Toronto. Perfect. So hi, everyone. If you don't know me, I'm Kath. I'm doing my PhD in pharmacology and and today I'm just going to talk a little bit about the different treatment drug avenues for the different GRIN genes. And really this is more of a talk um, for the parents to address some things that you might be wondering but that are impossible to Google. So one of the things you might be wondering is why on earth the kids are all so different from each other. So you probably already know that the GRIN genes make proteins that come together as a foursome of subunits. We call this a tetramer, which is either a mixture of GRIN1 and GRIN2, or GRIN1 and GRIN2 and GRIN3, or GRIN1 and GRIN3 proteins. And this complete complex forms what we call an NMDA receptor. And don't be frightened by this scary looking graphic. It's just to illustrate that, you know, when it's all put together, the point of the NMDA receptor is to regulate the flow of certain ions in and out of the cell. Um, and your body's need ions in order to transmit signals throughout the body and keep everything working. But that still doesn't really answer the question of why kids with different variants to different genes need different solutions. Well, it turns out that depending on which proteins made by the different genes are in each NMDA receptor, the NMDA receptor will behave a little differently. So I'll just provide a couple of examples. For example, the GRIN3A subunit um, has a lot of control over how well calcium ions go in and out of the cell. Um, GRIN2A has this special binding site for a very important messenger protein. Um, and GRIN1 always has to be there because it contains the glycine binding site and glycine has to be bound to the NMDA receptor each time it opens. So the, each of these are going to influence the properties of the receptor and your body needs them in these diverse subunit assemblies four different things. And I just want to return to this graphic because it tells us a little bit about where the different ligands and drugs actually bind to the NMDA receptor complex um, in order to influence its activity. So we can see that the GRIN1 subunit is where the necessary glycine binding site is, um, which is also the deserine site. Hyphen protol is a tricky one as it sits actually between GRIN1 and GRIN2B when it's present. And so it would probably be a, a little higher up here. And then uh, memantine sits down, sits down here in the pore loop. Um, and magnesium, which normally keeps the channel closed at rest, sits about uh, right about here in the middle of things. So here are just a few of possibly hundreds of examples of potential NMDA receptor targeting therapeutic treatments for GRIN disorders. So one of the more famous ones, of course, is D-serine. And this is an agonist of the GRIN1 subunit, meaning that it increases activity of the NMDA receptor. And rationally, this would be you know, something that clinicians might consider for a loss of function mutation. And then there are memantine and ketamine, which are antagonists, which means that they decrease the activity of the receptor and this is something um, clinicians might consider for a gain of function um, mutation. Um, and then there are drugs like mebostinol, and this is a positive um, allosteric modulator of GRIN1, which means that it binds to a special site called the allosteric site of um, uh, the NMDA receptor, and it actually just increases the probability that an agonist, either you know something that naturally occurs in the body or a different drug, will bind to the receptor complex. And then there are negative allosteric modulators such as this QNZ46, which is an experimental drug um, that has selectivity for GRIN2D containing which bind to the allosteric site and decreases the probability that an agonist will bind to the receptor complex. Um, then there are, of course, you know, uh, vitamins such as magnesium, um, certain and specific polyamines such as spermine, which target the polyamine site of uh, the NMDA receptor. 
Then there are certain and specific neurosteroids which target the neurosteroid site. And then of course there are these drugs that indirectly target the NMDA receptor. So again, you know, we don't need to go through this graphic, but what it's meant to show is just how connected the NMDA receptor is to all of these other different processes in the body. And so either upstream or downstream of the NMDA receptor, this might um, represent a an avenue for different therapeutic um, potentials in in treating your child. So the key takeaways from this talk are that you know the NMDA receptor is heavily studied, and this should be you know a bit of a saving grace um, in terms of grand disorders in general because it has many different identified ligands, and there are, are lots and lots of different things to try. Um, also, that even though all the kids have different mutations to different NMDA receptor genes, you know, they were we, they will all manifest in very different ways. And there are reasons for this. Um, lastly, I just wanted to say that, you know, the most meaningful um, notes that you can compare as a parent conversations with other parent occurs between, you know, yourselves and the parents of kids with the exact same or very similar mutations. And the idea there is just that, you know, because all of the mutations are so very different, the ones that are most likely to be similar to your child will have, you know, the exact same variant. So thank you very much. Wonderful, thank you so much for that, Catherine. So next we have a presentation from Dr. Zhang. Uh, and also, it looks like we'll be joined by Paul as well when he gets a chance to log on. But Dr. Zhang, you can go ahead and share your screen and start presenting. Okay. Uh, thank you for having me here. And today I will talk about one patient with green one variants with treatment with memantine and some molecular mechanism. And uh, most of work was done by Dr. Yuan and Dr. Trainer's lab. And uh, this is the patient information. This patient now is 30 months old. He was born at term without family history of epilepsy. Parents first noted the patient has a startle movement during the first one to two weeks of life, during which patient extended his arm suddenly, and then each episode lasts only for one to two seconds. The typical epileptic spasm starts at two months of age and develop tonic-clonic seizure after 10 months of age. The episode increase in severity and frequency and they become too numerous to account. At the four months of age, EEG shows electrodecument with, act, with typical infantile spasm. His CTH was start to treat at four months of age. The epileptic spasm was less severe and demonstrated a 50% reduction in frequency without complete result resolutions. After ACTH discontinuation, patient spasm recur up to 100 to 200 times a week. Patient also was treated with fobamate, clobidum, and vigabatrin, continue having frequent and numerous spasm and tonic-clonic seizures. Patient has severe developmental delay on three AEDs. On examination, patient was very drowsy, difficult to arouse, no eye contact, no tracking, with hypotonia, poor height control, and appendicular hypotonia and spasticity diffuse hyperreflexia. MRI of brain at three months age was reportedly normal. This is the variant we found in the M641. We know the M, uh, M3 is the transmembrane dom is the M variance is in the transmembrane domain M3. This position is highly conserved across most vertebrate species. There are other two patients we found uh, what was found has the same mutation. One patient in Japan with a similar onset at two months of age with kind of a breath holding attack, abnormal eye movement, and tonic posturing. And the EEG showed diffusely spike and poly spike wave at three months of age, which is similar to hyper hyperthermia pattern. Patient also had severe developmental delay, other stereotyped movement. MRI of brain shows a cerebral atrophy. Patient was refractory to multiple AED, including 
epicote, clobosome, and phenobarbital. Another patient was, found, was seen in Phoenix, three years old, born on term, and uh, had a severe developmental delay, was noted at four months of age. Infantile spasm start at six months of age. This hypothermia pattern, spasm temporarily resolved with AT ACTH treatment. Unfortunately, patient the spasm recurred uh, and the refractory multiple anti seizure medication and the VNS placement. The MR also shows some cerebral volume loss and the scene corpse closer. This is some functional study about the variance M641. The number one, we see the voltage, uh, the M641 variance reduced voltage dependent magnesium inhibition by H fold. We also found M61 variance enhanced MD receptive, synaptic, and non synaptic signal by six, uh, by three and two fold. The M641 variance is also very sensitive. It's more sensitive to FDA approved MD receptor channel blockers, including mamantine, ketamine, dactromethorphine, dactrophine, and amantadine. This is how we treat with mamantine above this patient. The mamantine start at 40 months of age with 0.2 milligram per kilogram per day divided by two and slowly increase to 0.4 milligram per kilogram per day. And uh, at the same time, we continue his seed medications. Three weeks after momentum treatment, his spasma and tonic cedar reduced significantly from 150 to 200 times a week to one to two weeks, uh, one to two times a week. Interestingly, patient was accidentally missed two days of momentum after three months of treatment. Then his cedar increasing significantly up to 30 to 50 times a week of spasma and 15 to 20 times a week on tonic clonic cedars. One week after we start the momentum, his cedar reduced significantly to 10 to 20 times spasma a week and five to 10 times tonic clonic cedar a week. Six months after the treatment, after the restart treatment, patient's spasma remain under good control. Repeat EEG at three months of age after treatment, demonstrate mild slow of the background, no uplift from discharge. You can see the on the upper level, the, the, this is the one before the treatment and the, the, the bottom one is the after treatment. Patient was more alert and calmer by parent report. Patient was last follow up after nine months treatment, patient see the remain under good control. And at the same time, we also decreased the, his uh, anti seizure medication, Fobamate, Vagabotrin, and the Clobazer. Summary. Recurrent de novo green one M641 variants was identified in patient with early onset epileptic encephalopathy. The M3 variants cause conflicting functional changes. Number one, significant decrease voltage dependent magnesium block with mild change in agonist potency and the proton sensitivity. Two, reduce channel open probability. Third, reduce receptor cell surface expression. M6041 variants contribute to enhance AMD receptivity receptor synaptic and non-synaptic signal. A set of NMD3 antagonists was evaluated to mitigate the altered variance function to explore potential personalized treatment. The momentum, the momentum trial significantly improved patient cedar burden and the in the future appropriate clinical trial including more green one patient unnecessary to further establish the safety and efficacy for long-term treatment with mamantin. Thank you.
so much, Dr. Zhang. So now we'll hand it over to Paul, who will describe his experience as a parent of a child who has been prescribed Lamantine. Okay, you have both of us <laughs> today. <laughs> How are you? Good to see you. Um, so basically, when, when they started the Mimimitine or Namenda as we know it, um, it we, the only persons that we told that Austin was taking that new drug was um, anybody medically in his involved, his nurses, the school, his one-on-ones at school, um, because we tried so many things prior to that, including uh, holistic approaches. You know, as a parent, we want the best for our kid, and we tried everything. Um, so the only persons, like we said, we told were just anybody medically involved in his life. We didn't tell our uh, his uh, grandparents, uh, siblings, um, you know, uh, friends, neighbors, anybody that sees Austin on a daily basis, we didn't tell them that we started this new medicine. So we noticed pretty much immediately uh, Austin's seizures in the daytime um, subsided, like in the awake state. And honestly, since, you know, we'll look and confirm, but since we started this, um, he hasn't really had one seizure in the awake state. He still has some, as he, when he sleeps at nighttime, um, but other than that, it's been working wonders. Um, we're very happy with it and with the Emory University working with them, they were awesome. Um, what else can we say? I mean, you know, the, the one advice that I would give to parents is that um, if you do start a new medicine, you know, just to keep it within the immediate family, don't tell people who's, uh, you know, other than medically involved in the child's life to see if it really is making a difference. Um, because all we could see is the outside and, and how the child behaves. And uh, we don't know anything medically going on inside. So we'll leave that to the doctors to do all that testing. But um, it's nice to hear other people that haven't seen your child in a while to say, oh, man, you know, you know, we, oh, we see a change in Austin. Did you guys see something new or did you do something new? So that's that would be our recommendation um, for anybody trying any new medicine with their child. Anything? Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing. We really appreciate that. No so now we're going to hand it over to Dr. Muglia, who has some information to share with us about Rodipradil. Um, yes, thank you. Thank you. Can you can you all hear me? OK. Yes. And you can see the slides, I, I suppose. Very good. OK, well, first of all, thank you, Megan, and to you and Keith and, and Denise for giving me the to me and the team, the opportunity to introduce you to our project. Um, this is a, a project we were working on uh, for a while, but now it, since a week uh, we managed to, to to start a company out of it. So I'm really, you know, we're really early days. Uh, so here is just uh, to give you a, a quick introduction. So the company we name it Green Therapeutics because uh, the primary focus is uh, to to develop a Radiprodil, that is a candidate drug uh, for uh, uh, children that have a uh, certain genetic variants that, that lead it to gain of function. And um, so, of course, you know, you know, we, we have a little time here and we're really at the beginning. So the only thing we're we going to do is to give you a quick introduction to the program. Uh, surely we're not going to be able to address and answer your question, but uh, I would like to reassure you that, um, you know, this is just uh, the first uh, time we, we talk uh, to you about the project and we would like really to, st to start a dialogue and collaboration with the community to make sure that whatever we do in the program is the, the most appropriate uh, thing to do for, for, for the children. And um, so uh, I'm, I'm not so sure uh, Hillary was uh, part also of the team and is our head of community engagement uh, is uh, was trying to connect, but probably had some issue. I don't think uh, she managed to connect back, so I'm going to continue myself. Um, unless Hillary is there. No, I don't think it, it is. Uh, okay, so but basically, uh, you know, you see on, on the slide that uh, there is a there is a, a snapshot of, uh, of of the team that most of it uh, is connected today, and uh, you know there are also other people behind, but these are the, the key uh, players at the moment. As I said, you know, it just started, and uh, and uh, you know, I'm going to now going to start to give you few more details about Radiprodil. And I'm glad that, you know, the previous talk uh, explained a bit of the pharmacology so they make my, my presentation hopefully a bit easier to follow. Um, so Radiprodil, you know, first of all, it's, it's a clinical stage. The molecule, uh, the candidate drug has been in development for quite some time. 
so there are more than 400 adult patients that they have been tested with a molecule. So we have extensive uh, database uh, in, in adults, uh, safety database in adults uh, uh, with various dosage and various information. And out of all this information, uh, we managed to, to, to come up with uh, an understanding of what would be the appropriate dose uh, for, for, for infants and for, for children. Uh, and we started, uh, you know, some time ago before we made the company, um, with the testing in, uh, in infants with infantized spasms. So we have accumulated experience with uh, three infants. And uh, they were, of course, all uh, uh, with severe uh, spasm. They hadn't responded to a CTH or bagabatrin. And so they, they have a test that we tested uh, radipidil for up to a month in these uh, three infants. And one of them had the seizure uh, freedom and the other had the reduction of seizures. Uh, difficult to come up with any conclusion, but um, surely was uh, was a safe and well tolerated in this infant. And so that gave us, uh, you know, a good, uh, a good um, hope that the drug will continue to, to do well uh, in, in pediatric population. And now because of the mechanism of action you heard on the previous talk um, and you saw that there are what we call negative allosteric modulator. And so radiprodil, as you might associate it to the other name, there was ephemprodil, it, it binds it to the same site. So it's a, it's a negative allosteric modulator. So modulate negatively the receptor. And, uh, and for that reason, uh, we believe it might be uh, able to, to control a, a seizure or the, the rest of other symptoms that, uh, that uh, you know, suffer, the children suffer from. Um, when the, 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 the children have a gain of function uh, genetic variants, uh, so the, the, the drug is a negative modulator and the gain of function increase the responsiveness to glutamate. So for that reason, we believe it might be an opportunity uh, for these kids. Um, we have uh, tested in a few um, mutations there in, in vitro, the, you know, and the, that is showed that basically this overactive uh, receptor uh, coded by the, the genetic variants that give gain of function, it can be to some extent controlled. Um, I would say pro almost normalized. I would say normalized uh, in, in its activity uh, by radiprodil. Um, at the time, there were not that many models and uh, that were suitable to do testing, particularly for seizure and green green models. So we had done a variety of uh, animal models. Um, they have uh, seizures and uh, we show the, the effect of, of as an anticonvulsant or a in many of these models. And so we also collected information about the relevant dose. And so we have all this information now together with the formulation of the drug that is suitable uh, for, for a pediatric population is a syrup or making suspension. Um, so we have all this information and all this data that allow us uh, to do a clinical study. And this is um, that we'll test initially uh, the safety and the tolerability and the different doses, uh, what effect we can achieve uh, with this drug and uh, and then progress into the development. Uh, as you know, probably we have to do this uh, stage, uh, a different stage, we will increase the number of patients until a point uh, where we will understand uh, its activity, uh, its efficacy. So the first step would be to do this, this clinical study and, um, and that they will be preparing uh, to do um, that that study in the in, in the in the coming future and now i'll just maybe to be more specific about the drug because you you heard about memantine and um, and i wanted to show you here you know there's a lot of details in this slide uh but uh, two key points uh, well first of all i was i should say that you know as you know every children has a different mutation almost so at least there are many many different kinds of mutations that give a different biology biological response uh, and the reason I'm saying this is that because memantine, we have shown in vitro that in, in some patient uh, with a certain green to be mutation, it, it might not be effective, uh, at least it's not effective in vitro. And you see on the right side that memantine, you see these different lines, uh, uh, these curves. And uh, one specific curve that corresponds to a genetic variance, it doesn't overlap with the others. That means that in this case, memantine is not normalizing the overactive receptor. On the left side, you see radiprodil where all the lines are overlapping, meaning that in the same mutation, this time it is normalized. So I think it, this is, is saying that, you know, in some patients, you know, you know, we might get a better response to radiprodil than memantine, 
and uh, the, the concept and the idea here that we will uh, we will be moving very cautiously, trying to understand as much as we can in vitro first uh, which patient might be suitable for for for, uh, for benefiting from the drug, and so as such uh, we will be testing uh, radiprodil um, in well characterized <laughs> patients that may get benefit. And this is all about green to be uh, because of the biology and the pharmacology, there might be potential for uh, gain of function in also other receptors like green one and green two A. At this stage, we have uh, no data ourselves. Uh, there, there are a bit more data in the literature and, and different labs, uh, but um, we will be testing the opportunity also for these other genetic variants in the other subunits. But at this stage, we, we, we don't have any, any data we can share. So I'll get to the next slide to conclude uh, and just to say that, as I said at the beginning, you know, this is nothing we can do by our own. Uh, we would like uh, really to, to see this is, as the first uh, um, is part of our uh, conversation uh, where we start to share some highlights of the program and uh, we would like to continue with this dialogue uh, uh, with the community and, of course, the scientists and the clinician. So we will continue to do that, and in the meantime, we'll prepare all the, the documentation required to, 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 to be able to get approval to start the study. And if everything goes fine, we might be in a position to do a, a clinical study uh, next year, maybe at the middle of next year, around those timelines. So I'll just conclude here, and uh, you know, thanks for, for listening to me, and uh, happy to, if we have the opportunity now or later on, to address uh, any question you might have uh, about uh, you know, our program. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Muglia, as well as Dr. Zhang and Paul and Catherine for all sharing um, some very exciting information today. It looks like so far we had one question in the Q&A that's already been addressed, and then we have a question in the chat that I believe is probably directed to Dr. Muglia, um, related to when you talk about a variety of animal models available, which ones uh, do you have so far? Um, the, the, the audiogenic seizure model uh, is the, the one that we use uh, mostly. Um, we use uh, in a variety of uh, setting, or at least with a different variety of baseline drugs. Um, as you probably know, when, when we do trials, but also in clinical practice, in practice, we add the one anticonvulsant on top of the other. So what we did in the adiogenic model, we tested the efficacy on uh, on top of uh, levetiracetam, carbamazepine, and diazepam, uh, so that are some of the, the drugs that uh, often are prescribed. We also did a, a study with the pilocarpine uh, model uh, that uh, is a bit more of a subchronic treatment. And uh, so that's kind of the, the, the main uh, the main the main studies that uh, we have we have done the other study we have done uh, is also at a different age uh, stage of the the the, the, the rodents uh, because we see a prevalent activity in uh, in the younger animals than in adult animals and uh, at the moment we are designing a study there has been a, a new animal model for green to a kind of function uh, mutation that um, also with the audiogenic seizure uh, can be tested at the activity and we are in the process of starting that testing. So that's uh, so far all the, the data we have in preclinically. Okay. So it looks like we have a question uh, related to any trials for drugs and challenging behavior. So I guess we'll open that one up, um, Dr. Zhang or Dr. Muglia. If anybody has any thoughts about uh, trials for drugs with challenging behavior? I don't aware any new clinical trial for just specific for the behaviors. The patient has a intractable epilepsy, no matter what the etiology is, tends to have more behavior problem. This is very common, and uh, the behavior problem is always challenging for us too. We always uh, consider to cooperate with the psychiatry to treat. At the same time, we treat the seizures. Great, thank you for that explanation, Dr. Zhang. So our next question is, uh, do you have a database of patients that are interested in a clinical study? If not, how can we participate in studies? Uh, if, if not, how can we participate if the studies are open for the public? Yeah, no, I think that's, that's a very important question for us. Um, so you know we 
we are well connected to, to the scientific community and uh, with Johannes and, and team and, and, and Steve, uh, uh, you know, at the various, uh, you know, site that develop the Cure Green portal. And uh, so we will be working together with the with them uh, with the foundations uh, to 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 understand where where to to, to we can best start. Uh, so as I said, at the moment we don't have any information. We know that this information exists, uh, and uh, we will collaborate to 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 make sure, as I said, that we will do the the optimal job. Perfect. So we had another question about what therapies are considered for GRIN 2A with an underactive NMDA receptor. So I can probably take this question. Uh, for a loss of function like GRIN 2A variant, generally because a lot of the therapies um, target the GRIN 1 subunit, that's still probably your best druggable target, and that's something you can talk to your clinician about. Um, there are some, you know, positive allosteric modulators um, that are being developed that have specificity for the GRIN 2A. Um, um, this is something that can be looked into uh, much more easily on Google if you um, search for glue N2A instead of GRIN 2A, because in the scientific community, the protein for GRIN 2A is referred to as glue N2A. Um, so that would be kind of my tip there. And as far as I know, all of those drugs are quite experimental. But just to say that, you know, science is advancing. Thank you for that explanation, Catherine. So we had another question about could these drugs benefit older patients or non-epileptic patients? Yeah, that's such a great question. Um, I think so, most definitely. I don't think that age is necessarily a factor in treatment here. Of course, the longer that you know um, somebody's seizures are uncontrolled, the more complicated things get at a brain-wide level. But of course, I think that these um, these avenues have potential for older patients, um, non-epileptic patients uh, as well. Um, uh, yeah, I actually. That's getting into a very nitty gritty science question, but um, you know, it's really hard to define what exactly you know constitutes epileptic activity. Um, and I definitely think that you know, given that there's so much commonalities among the variants at like a level, it may not necessarily matter whether they're epileptic or not. I don't know how much sense that makes, but that's my rationale. So I see another question related to AMPA receptor medications. I just wanted to let that person know that we did have another person who was planning to present today but couldn't be here last minute. Um, I'm not sure if any of the other panelists would like to answer if there are any uh, AMPA receptor medications, particularly for loss of function that anyone knows of. Yeah, so I am an NMDA receptor researcher, so I, I'm definitely not um, an expert, but uh, AMPA receptors are a lot like NMDA receptors, and they are, you know, inherently quite druggable as well. Different drugs that exist for AMPA receptors as well, um, and so, you know, I think that the 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 therapeutic avenues for AMPA receptor related genes are just as bright as NMDA receptor related genes. There's only one uh, AMPA receptor antagonist on the market called Facampa. But that means for the gain of the function of the amplant, probably not for the loss of function. Yes. I have a question for Dr. Maglia. Sure. What, what's the difference for the Radeprodil and the Fulbomate? You know, the Fulbomate has been on the market over 30 years. Do you see it's also working on the uh, green, one, uh, green 2B? Yes, it's a good question. I think it's uh, yes. In fact, uh, you know, we see that felbamate is effective in in infantile spasms. I'm not so sure that there are direct experience on 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 children with the green uh, variants. Um, the difference, though, is that um, uh, has also other um, um, activities on others on GABAergic system, for example. So it's a bit of a more uh, 
uh, diversified mechanism, I would say. So it's not as specific and uh, and uh, and potent as uh, rodipotent. And the, of course, this is in the efficacy and pharmacology part. But as you know, uh, there is a, a, a safety and tolerability issue with the felbamates that uh, restrict this use. Um, but that's that's uh, that's another story. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. So our next question, uh, I believe, is there any experience on suitable drugs for GRIN1 uh, with severe breathing disorders or apneas? Any thoughts? I, I'm not a clinician, so I unfortunately don't have much insight into how to treat specific symptoms. Yeah, it, it's difficult to answer because, uh, well, first of all, there's, there's not an answer uh, or clear answer or some, anybody that I, it knows. Uh, and, you know, I would say that a lot of things that we are discussing uh, in terms of treatment um, are, particularly when you target the, the primary cause of the disease, in theory, you should have an effect on other symptoms. Um, so if you target the, the, the primary cause, uh, you know, potentially there is an effect uh, on, 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 uh, on apnea or breathing. Um, the fact that, you know, for ourselves, for example, we are focused on seizure as many others is because this is a, an epiphenomenon that can be more easily measured and uh, we can get an approval more, more rapidly. At least we can communicate data more clearly. But clinically or biologically speaking, uh, we should see an effect on also other symptoms. So I, I won't expect that there will be a specific treatment just for breathing, but it um, will be important to find a treatment that also is a causative and go the causation of the disease and that will help as such a breathing. Uh, that's, you know, I know that, you know, it's not a perfect answer, uh, but I'm not so sure some, someone, uh, the other clinician might also in the call might be able to address in the other session as well. Perfect. Well, thank you all for your time and attention. I really wanted to take a chance to thank our speakers and uh, to Dr. Muglia for sharing an exciting announcement with us, Dr. Zhang for sharing his work in recent publication, Catherine with her great overview that she gave us, as well as Paul sharing their family story. Um, we really appreciate everyone taking the time to learn more about drugs and molecules um, and what treatments are out there for GRI patients. So it looks like we are just about out of time. So I wanted to thank everyone again, and we'll see you in another breakout session. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.